Right. Friends, welcome to Daily Power Parsha. Today is Monday, May 31st. This is the last day before June 1st, the last day before the month of June, which makes a lot of sense, being that it's May 31st. And so we are going to begin the Torah portion of Shlach. This is one of the most dramatic Torah portions in the entire Torah. Um, you know, every every parsha, every portion has its own energy. Shlach is just epically dynamic. It's it's so interesting. It's so powerful on so many different levels. So I'm going to. I was thinking, you know, it's so weird. Some like last week we had some very powerful ones, and I'm thinking, you never know. It's like you just read them. It's just on print. They're all seemingly the same, but some of the, some of them are just so dramatic and you know, and relating to Hashem. And then yeah. some are just, we built the temple, we did this, yeah. But there's right, no yeah, planning. some are def, yeah, some are definitely more, I don't know yeah. if the word is like seemingly mechanical or it's like, you know, like you get details, it's more of like right. an architecture conversation. Yeah. Um, but of course there's meaning in that. But this, like I, the narrative pieces of it, those are the really, the, in my opinion, the juice that like the most, the easiest, juiciest parts it's easy to find the juiciness of it so that's what we're gonna that's what we're gonna do today so let's jump in um i'm gonna share my screen with you shlach is the torah portion and we're gonna start with with reading number one today the goal is to cover one and two because today is monday so we'll do sundays and mondays all right number chapter 13 verse number one here we go again there's ways too much to speak about almost. I'm going to try to get in as much as I can. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, send out for yourself men who will scout the land of Canaan or of Canaan, which I'm giving to the children of Israel. So God says, send out for yourself men. It's almost like I literally have like mountains of, ins of commentaries on each of these words. Shlach, send out for yourself men. All of these have commentaries on it. Like li literally every word could be a hyperlink to, uh, to, to tremendous insight. But let's, let's read through the narrative and then I'll circle back. So God says, send out for yourself men who will scout, scout the land of Canaan, which I'm giving to the children of Israel. You shall send one man each for his father's tribe. Each one shall be a chieftain in their midst. So essentially 12 scouts, one per tribe, not including the tribe of Levi, not Shevet Levi, no Levites. Remember, there are two systems of 12 tribes. There's the 12 tribes with Levi, with the Levites, and then there's 12 without. How do you get 12 without? If there's 12 with, how do you get 12 without? You divide Joseph or Yosef into Ephraim and Manasseh and his two sons, and then you have 12 again. Anyway, so here we go. So 12, 12 scouts, for the each one per tribe. So Moses sent them from the desert of Paran. Oh, and that's where I showed you last week. Remember, I held up that um, that map. I even have it here again. I have the Chumash next to me. So that little map of um, of their journeys, they were pretty much, they were close to the borders of Canaan. I mean, they weren't right there on the border, but they were a f just a few days journey from from the land of Israel, from the promised land. So he sent him, Moses dispatched them from the desert of Paran by the word of the Lord. All of them, listen to this, all of these 12 scouts were men of distinction. Okay? They were chashiv. They were important. They were honored and honorable. They were the heads of the children of Israel. These are their names. And I want you to th th just... Keep in mind this, this thing. We have had multiple opportunities to be introduced to leaders of the tribes. Okay? In the, in the last few portions in, in the book of Numbers. We talked about the tribal leaders who were assisting Moses and Aaron in the census. There was one leader per tribe that was assisting in the census. We spoke about the tribal leaders who would head up the journeys, the travels, and the encamping and, 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 and journeys of, of their particular tribes. And they were kind of like the, the tribal leaders to make sure that everyone's moving or everyone's stopping. And we've listed their names. And here we have a different set of names. In other words, those tribal leaders that we spoke about 
last week or the week before, or the week before that, those were one set of tribal leaders, and now we have another set of tribal leaders. Okay, so I guess sounds like there was more than one important person per tribe, and here we have a new set of representatives. For the tribe of Reuben, we have Shamua, the son of Zakor. For the tribe of, of Simeon, Shaphat, the son of Chori. For the tribe of Judah, Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. For the tribe of Issachar, Yigal, the son of Yosef. For the tribe of Ephraim, Hosea, the son of Nun. Now this guy, this Hosea, this is who we know as Yehoshua or Joshua, who becomes the future leader of the Jewish people. So that's a very important name right there. For the tribe of Benjamin, Palti, the son of Raphu. For the tribe of Zebulun, Gad Gadiel, the son of Sodi. For the tribe of Joseph, the tribe of Manasseh, Gadi, the son of Susi. For the tribe of Dan, Amiel, the son of Gamali. For the tribe of Asher, Sethor, the Sesur, the son of Michal. For the tribe of Naphtali, Nachbi, the son of Ovsi. For the tribe of God, Guuel, the son of Machi. All right, those are the 12. These are the names of the men Moses sent to scout the land. And name change alert, breaking news. Moses called Hosea, the son of Nun. He gave him a different name, Yehoshua, or in English, Joshua. I find it interesting that they keep the Hebrew for the original name and switch to the English for the new name. But I guess there's no English version of the old name because no one ever had to come up with a weird version of it because it's it was only in use for a few verses here. Anyway, his original name was, yeah. So was, was do people, did the other men accept that these men got chosen or was there any like rivalry or? I, I don't recall it being mentioned that there was a rivalry, but I, I think it's of interest. And I don't know that I have a conclusion and I haven't seen any commentaries point this out. I'm not saying there aren't, I haven't seen any. But I do think to me, it is interesting, maybe foreshadowing, maybe something else, that you have a different set of tribal leaders that suddenly appear on the scene for this job. And the job, I mean, just spoiler alert, the job tanks. I mean, it, it just blows up. So I, I think it's interesting, you know, what if they would have sent, you know, Nachshon, the son of Aminada for the, for the tribe of Judah, the guy who walked into the water and who helped count the people? Like, what if they sent those people? I don't know. I don't have an answer. Why did they switch? Maybe those guys didn't want to travel. Maybe they were older. I don't, I don't have an answer. I'm speculating. I don't have a, I don't have a solid answer. And really there's no, I don't know if it's useful if I speculate. I, I think it's more about, um, I, to me, it's interesting that you have a new set of guys and it just, it, it, it just blows up. Hey, Mark. Good to see Hi. you. Welcome. All right. So I want to point out just the name change here. It's going to be easier in the Hebrew. So his name was Hosea. It's there's a lama there, le Hosea, but that means two. Hosea, and it becomes Yehoshua, which is basically the same name with a yud in the beginning, right? Like there's a yud there, and there's no yud there. Hosea to Yehoshua. Hosea to Joshua. So what is he adding? What sorry, what is Moses adding to his name? The letter yud. Well, we know what's the letter yud. It's the first letter of Hashem's Hashem. name, God's name. So we see that Moses gives him a little bit of a divine boost. Why? Here's where it gets interesting. Apparently, Moses had suspicions that this might be a challenging mission. And so, specifically to Hosea, to, to, this, to this fellow who was his right-hand man and primary student, Torah student, he specifically gave him the, the boost of a yud to his name, a little extra letter, not a little extra, but an extra letter to give him a little bit of a boost to, um, to withstand the tests of this, of this mission and do it successfully. Um, okay, let's continue. I'm going to circle back. I've, I have so much to talk about and I will circle back, but let's just get the story here. Um, Moses sent them to scout. Again, the second time we have the word scout, to scout the land of Canaan. And he said to them, this is Moses. These are the, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? This is the, this is the mission, the terms of the mission. Go up this way in the south and climb up the mountain. They were approaching Israel or Canaan 
They were approaching it from the south. Okay? Like I have, it's hard for you to see, I'm sure it's small, but you can see that. Ah. Oh my gosh. This is all over the place. You can see that that was their journey from Mount Sinai. And then they were supposed to go straight into to Canaan. Then they sinned and then they end up circling for 40 years. But that approach was from the south. Okay. So he says, Moses says, go up this way in the south and climb up the mountain. And you shall see, verse 18, you shall see what kind of land it is. And the people who inhabit it, are they strong or weak? Are there few or many? And what of the land they inhabit? So there's one, one thing is to check out the people, right? What, what, what's with the people? And then the question is, what kind of land is it? Is it good or bad? And what of the cities in which they reside? Are they in camps or in fortresses? So are they living like in open cities or fortified cities? These are questions that you should find out on this mission. And what is the soil like? Is it fat or lean? Are there any trees in it or not? You shall remember, this is before drones and satellite imagery. They didn't know. Moses didn't know on the ground, at least, you know, prophetically is one thing, but I don't know if he had a prophecy about that specifically, but, you know, he get information, hit the ground and get, gather intel. You shall be courageous and take from the fruit of the land. And the Torah tells us it was the season when the first grapes begin to ripen. So they were able to get, they would have been able to get some of the fruit of the land to bring it back as samples, which Moses tells them to do. He says, be courageous and take from the fruit. You know, when you're trying to bring fruit across borders, <laughs> there's passport, they say, customs, do you have anything? Fruit, ah, they confiscate it. I'm kidding, but he says, oh be God. courageous and take other fruit of the land. I want to go back and talk about a few, I want to point out a few things. Number one, this portion, Shlach, is known for the story of the spies, the spies who went rogue. But one thing we see right away is they were not called spies. They were called scouts. What's the difference? A scout is just gathering information. A spy is already a little bit more entrenched in a mission and finding out some stuff a little bit on a deeper level. So it seems that the intention was that was for them just to scout out the land and to report back, but not to spy. A spy implies that based on your intelligence, we're going to adjust strategy or whatever it is. But that's not necessarily what they were being sent to do. Why were they sent? So now I need to tell you the real backstory of what happened. The real backstory is that Moses was not interested in sending anybody. He was interested in going with God and entering the land of Israel and, and facing whatever they were destined to face. That was the plan. But then the people came to Moses and said to Moses, we are afraid because we're stepping into an unknown enemy, unknown territory, and that for us is frightening. And they said to Moses, please, we want to send people to gather intel. So Moses goes to God. I'm giving you the backstory. And Moses says to God, what should I do? The people are asking to send, you know, representatives, scout, whatever, to scout spies, whatever. They're asking to send people into the land to check it out. What should I do? God says, Hashem says, for the first time, Moshe, Moses, do what you think is best. God does not give him an answer. God does not tell Moses, no, it's a terrible idea, or yes, it's a great idea. Hashem says, God says to Moshe, do what you want. Rashi says, this is the meaning of the second verse, send out for yourself. What does it mean for yourself? It seems to be an unnecessary word. You should just say, send out men who will scout. What's for yourself? God, yourself is a reference to Moses. God is saying, Shlach licha. I want you to make the choice. Send out if you yourself want to. So in other words, the translation really, or the interpretation is a little bit different than the translation. It's really send out if you want men who will scout the land of Canaan. So God gives it up to Moses. God says to Moses, it's up to you. He gives the choice to Moses. Why? So the Rebbe explains because they were, they were at the cusp, poised to enter the land of Israel. And that would begin a new era of Jewish life. 
Heretofore, up until now, it was all about, as we've discussed many times, top down. God is doing all the work, all the heavy lifting. It's God who's bringing the plagues and God who is taking the people out and God who is splitting the sea and God who's giving the Torah and God who's giving the commandments regarding the building of the tabernacle. It's God, God, God. And it's being everything is being, being dictated. Everything is a script and we're just trying to follow the script. But once we enter the land of Israel, the ideal was that things should change, that we should we as a people should begin to take ownership over our spiritual paths, over our connection with Hashem, that we should become equal partners in this great, magnificent um, task called bringing heaven down to earth, that we should be active, active partners in that fulfillment. And so Hashem says to Moshe, it starts right now. And it starts with you as the leader making a decision. So I'm not going to tell you what to do. If you think it's a good idea, go for it. If not, don't go for it. But if I keep on dictating, where's the growth? It's kind of like a parent at a certain point will say to the child, not because the child is begging necessarily for that autonomy, but the parent says, I know that you need autonomy to be a healthy person. You need to have your own sense of identity to be a person. Even though, listen to this, Hashem knew it was going to, to go south and backfire. Even though Hashem knew, at the very least, that it was fraught with danger, and of course, God knows the future. There's no past, present, future. God knew that it was going to blow up completely. God still told Moses, it's your choice, because sometimes, not always, but sometimes, it's more important to give the gift of independence than ensure that things get done correctly. And that sounds like a very bold statement, but with a little bit of life experience, we know that it's true. It's sometimes better for our kids to get it wrong on their own than to get it right with us holding their hands. And if a child knows that, that yes, they messed up, but it's because you believe in them and you trust in them and, you're give, and you respect them to give them that independence, they're going to be motivated to get it right. The child that feels that they don't have space to breathe, that they're being handheld, is the child that's more likely to be resentful and to specifically want to go against the, you know, the, the ideal to assert their own independence. Whereas if a parent says, look, I, I trust you. You're big enough. You're not going to make all the right choices. Don't worry. No one ever does. I didn't. The Jewish people didn't. You know, maybe even Moses didn't. I don't know. It may be too bold to say whatever, but, but this is a part of growth. And I believe in you. And, I'm, and, and I, I believe that you're strong enough to pick yourself back up when you fall. And I believe that. And, I, and I'm here for you, you know, not to, not to do it for you, but to be here with you whenever you need. That gives a child a sense of independence and a sense of really that the parent believes in this. Message. And that, that, yeah, that, and that is, that's more powerful than getting it right. The notion that someone believes in you is more important than getting it right. Sometimes we don't try, try not to speak in absolutes, but oftentimes this is true. Does this make sense? Yes. Okay. So God says to Moses, Send for yourself. In other words, if you want to do it, great. Even though God knows it's going to blow up, it's part of the part of the growth process. You can't walk without falling. That's that's the truth. You can't ride a bike without falling, right? Okay. Um. Good. And again, scouting. They were yes, Mark. Uh, unless you've already covered that, did uh, you talk about the chronological order? of uh, the Parsha, because I came in late? No, I didn't mention okay. it. Yeah, because yeah, Rashi says that why was the passage of the spies placed next to the passage of Miriam? And he says, for she was stricken over matters of speech when, when she spoke against her brother. And these wicked ones, the spies, saw what happened to her, yet did not take a lesson from her. Yeah. In other words, they she spoke ill of her brother and she got saras and got quarantined for seven days. And then these spies spoke ill. Well, we haven't gotten to the story, but they spoke ill of Israel, the land of Israel and Hashem. 
and uh, they they, sh they should have known better to be careful what you say, and hence the hence the juxtaposition of these two stories. Yeah, so, R R Rashi yeah. even goes on to say that uh, I won't read that. Goes on to say that Korach actually came before the spies, but that the right. parsha is juxtaposed. I'm, like, I'm sorry. Rashi just says the Korach comes before the spies. Okay, that's all. Yeah, but they, they, they still the position is yes, yeah, right. highlighting this idea of the lesson that should have been yeah. learned. Yeah, so so what we have here is again, Hashem says, "Send for yourself." I'm not going to tell you what to do. I believe in you. Um, and scout, not spy, but scout. Just check it out. Like there's no, it's not, it's not like we're going to adjust strategy based on it, but it's to really make the people feel more comfortable. The people were a little bit nervous. And this was going to be a way for them to feel a little bit more confident, but not necessarily like, oh, based on this, on the spying, we're going to adjust military strategy. What kind of military strategy? It's going to be Hashem that leads us into battle, right? So it's not like we're going to suddenly, you know, like, oh, let's go in through the water, through the sea instead of the grass. It's like, I mean, really? You're just going to, you're going to follow God anyway. So what's the scout? The scouts is to let the people know that don't worry, it's fine. Everything's going to be okay. That was really the point, but they took themselves too seriously, which we'll see in a moment. Um, and there's a commentary, I forget who says, I forget which commentary, who says that what was the problem? That Moshe sent men. This is literally one of the classic commentaries who says, and I could look it up, I have uh, the Macros Godolis over there with all the commentaries, but whatever. He says, what's the issue? They sent men. Had they sent women, it wouldn't have been a problem. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the women would have never spoke disparagingly about Israel or God. It would have never whipped people up into a panic. The issue was they sent men. I told you before, every word here, right? At least in these first few words, literally in the Hebrew, shlach lecha anashim v'yasuru. Those four words, you could have classes and classes just on those four words in all the commentaries. Okay, but let's fast forward because I do want to move through this a little bit. So we talked about the 12 leaders. We read this before. And then Moses gives them their operating instructions. Go to the south, climb a mountain, check out the land. And these are the questions. In other words, imagine you have a clipboard. You have, you know, clipboard with, with questions. And you have to answer these questions, right? What kind of land is it? What about the people? Strong or weak? Few or many? Um, what type of land is it? Good or bad? What about the cities? Fortified or not fortified? What is the soil like? What is the fruit like? These are the questions. Notice the question. <laughs> At no point in time did Moses say, by the way, let me know if this is doable. Right? That was not a question. The question wasn't, do you think we can do it? Or should we wait? That's not the question. The question is just bring us back a report about the land. Whether we can do it or not, of course we can do it. We have Hashem with us. The same God that defeated the that, that broke the Egyptians split the sea and gave us the Torah and has been guiding us through our travels this whole time, you know, for about a year with money from heaven. Yeah, that God can pull this off also. It's not a question. The question is only bring a report back from the land. Well, let's jump into the second reading. So chapter 13, verse 21. I love how it begins. So, and so they did. So they went up. Remember, they went north and explored the land from the desert of Zin until or Tzin, until Rechov, at the entrance to Hamat. Not Hamas, that's something else. This is Hamas. Not Hamas either. All right, it's a place. So they went south, then this way, that way. They went up in the south, and he, oh, look at this one. They went up in the south, and he came to Hebron. To Hebron. Who's he? Rashi says... Caleb, Caleb, one of the 12 reps, one of the 12 representatives, Caleb, he went to Hebron. What is in Hebron? Who knows? What famous holy site is in the city of Hebron? It's a burial site. I know. Very special people. It's the cave uh, of, cave of, of the Machpelah. Machpelah. Yes, the cave of Ma'arat Machpelah, where Adam and Eve. Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca, and Jacob and Leah, or Leah, that's where they, the four couples, are 
laid to rest. Yeah. So it says that on the journey, he, only one of the 12, only Caleb, came or went to Hebron. To Hebron. Why? To pray at the gravesite of the tzaddikim, of the righteous that were buried there. And what did he pray? Please, God, save me. Keep my head on straight that I don't get sucked into the, um, the strategy of these other guys. He sensed already that these guys had misunderstood or misconstrued either unknowingly or knowingly their mission. They had distorted their, their marching orders. Instead of seeing themselves as scouts, they were spies. Instead of reporting, they were deciding. They, 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 the, a sense of self-importance crept in. The next thing you know, the mission is up to them. They're going to make it or break it. That was not their, their original mandate. They had morphed it into something bigger than it should than it should have been. And but look, that's what happens when you give people choice and you give people responsibilities. Like I said before about parenting children, you, you, you give someone or even managing people right in a company, you give someone actual, um, you give them responsibility, they could do great or they could blow it up. It's if you really delegate. You've really delegated, and this is what happens. So Caleb recognizes the danger and Davin. So now we have two of the 12 spies that had an additional spiritual boost. Yehoshua, Joshua, who got the extra Yud in his name, a spiritual boost, and Caleb, who prayed at the graves of the patriarchs and matriarchs, he also got his own self-induced boost. All right, so here we go. Let's continue this verse. They went up in the south. He came to Hebron, and there were, here we go, Achiman, let me highlight these guys, Sheshai and Talmai, the descendants of the giant. These were large, very large men. Now, Hebron had been built seven years before Tzoan of Egypt. And the reason why the Torah is telling us that is to tell us, there's a Rashi on this. Um, Rashi says... The intention is to inform you of the excellence of the land of Israel. For there is no place in Israel rockier than Hebron, which is why it was designated for a burial ground. And there's no country in the world as excellent as Egypt, as it says, it was like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. Zo so on is the best part of Egypt for the residents of the kings is situated there, as it says for its principal and so on. Yet Hebron was superior to it seven times over. It says here, essentially, let me just explain Rashi, it says that Hebron had been built seven years before it's so on. The truth is it wasn't. It wasn't built before, chronologically. But it means it was seven times, seven years here means, it's a, it's a euphemism for seven times greater than Tzoan is Hebron. Even though Tzoan is the most beautiful place in Egypt and the lush land of Egypt, and Hebron is the rockiest place in Israel, but Israel's, so to speak, rockiest place is more beautiful, more holy, more whatever, than even the lushest of Egypt. Hope that makes sense. That's what Rashi explains. So anyway, they went and took this tour and they saw giants. These are the three giants they saw. Next, they came to the Valley of Eshkol. Eshkol actually means a cluster of grapes in Hebrew. And what did they do there in Eshkol? You guessed it. They cut a branch with a cluster of grapes. They carried it on a pole between two people. That's how big it was. A cluster of grapes required a pole between two people to carry. And they also took some pomegranates and figs. These fru fruits were lush and amazing and giant-sized. They called that place the Valley of Eshkol. Why? Because of the cluster Eshkol of grapes that the children of Israel cut from there. So again, it became Eshkol because of the grapes, not the other way around. But anyway, I thought it's, uh, it's an interesting um, uh, wordplay over there. All right, let's continue verse 25. So basically, they, took the, they, got, they got a full tour. They got a full, oh, there you go. Ray, check out Ray's screen. Ray has got a, a depiction of the grapes. Is that grapes? Right. Yeah. I don't know if you can see it, but yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I see uh, people carrying it with a pole. There you go. Right. Yeah. Right. That was the giant fruit that they brought back. Yes, um, okay. So here we go. Let's do verse 26. They went. The spies, the, the, the scouts went. And, oh, no, I'm sorry. Verse 25. They return from scouting the land at the end of 40 days. That's going to be significant. 40 days is, will be very significant. So they came back. They came back to the Jewish camp. 
They went and they came to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel. Uh-oh, red flags right there. They called the press conference. Uh-oh, remember I told you they felt very important? Yeah, they felt so important that they couldn't trust Moshe and Aaron. They had to tell the people directly to be transparent. Are you with me on that, on that self-importance, on that power trip? Okay, it is what it is. You give people power and or give responsibility and it could end up backfiring, but that's part of progress. But this is what happens. It backfires. Who sent them? Moses. Who should they have come back to with the report? Moses. Who did they come back to? Moses and Aaron and the entire congregation, all the congregation of the children of Israel. And they came to them in the desert of Paran to Kadesh. They brought them back a report as well as the entire congregation. Oh, look at this. They brought them back a report as well as to the entire congregation. They literally were doing press conferences and news interviews for everyone to see. And they showed them, the people and the leaders, the fruit of the land. They told him and said, here we go. Here's a report. We came to the land to which you sent us. And yes, it is flowing with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. It's lush. In other words, you asked us about the land. The land oh, is very fertile. It is indeed flowing with milk and honey. This is its fruit. However, uh-oh, uh-oh, that word right there, right? That's it. We are done. We are done. This is it. We're finished. Right? It's The land is beautiful. The, the, the food, it's very fertile. It's amazing. However, the people who inhabit the land are mighty. And the cities are extremely huge and fortified. And there we saw even the offspring of the giant. And, and if you're not afraid yet, here we go. You know who's in the south? The Amalekites. Remember the, the nation, the first nation that attacked us after the exodus? Amalek. They live there. While the Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountainous region, the Canaanites dwell on the coast and alongside the Jordan. You see what's happening? What are they stirring? Fear. They're sowing fear. Immediately, Caleb sees where this is going. Caleb is the one who prayed at the gravesite, at the gravesites in Hebron, in Hebron. Caleb silence to people to hear about Moses. He said to the people, he knew he was dealing with a, a, a crowd that was about to turn into a mob. So he said, and you know what else Moses did? This is, I'm, I'm telling you what Rashi says based on our sages. Caleb says, and you know what else? And everyone's like, what else, what else? And you know what else Moses did? What? Moses split the sea and he took us out of Egypt. He began to to say good things. So Moses tries to turn it around. And then Caleb, sorry, Caleb tries to turn it around. And he said, Caleb said to the people, we can surely go up and take possession of it. In other words, don't panic. We can do this for we can indeed overcome it. But the men who went up with him, that means the other 10 spies, again, except for Joshua, who's also on the good side. But the men who went up with him said, we are unable to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. They are stronger than we. But you know what? That's not really the right translation. It's not we. Mimenu means him. And according to the commentaries, they weren't just saying that the people, the giants, are stronger than we. They're saying stronger than he with a capital H. They're saying even Hashem can't do it. And the question is, what, they didn't believe that Hashem could do it? Remember, this is Judaism 2.0. This is where God wants us to fight the battles. This is where God wants us to take initiative as they were empowered to do. And they said, if it's up to us, we can't do it. And Hashem also is not going to want to step in to do it. On some level, they're stronger than even Hashem. If Hashem doesn't want to do it, and we don't believe that Hashem's going to, so this is going to be a disaster. And uh, these spies, yeah. Did you mention already about the funerals? There were many funerals taken. No, good. Thank you for reminding me about that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Ray's saying something very important. 
um, in order to allow them to do their job and blend in, or at least not get um, become too suspicious, it says, and this is from the Medrash of the Talmud, it's brought down in Rashi also, says that Hashem caused lots of deaths to happen while they were scouting the land for the express purpose of pe people being distracted by all the deaths and the funerals so that no one would pay attention to these band of 12 visitors that were touring the country. So, and they came back and said, you know what kind of place it is? Everyone's dying all over the place. So they took a blessing and they turned it into a curse or they took a, a good thing and they made it into a bad thing. And that's, so again, the spies were, were doing their thing. That's, uh, that's part of what they were doing. All right, back Isn't inside. That when Job was buried? Back inside. Uh -huh. um, say it again? Isn't that when Job died and he, and he was being buried there? It could be. That is possible. That is, if you're ringing a bell, um, it is possible that was Job. It could be. I think I read that somewhere. Yeah. Makes, if you read it, then I'm going to, then I'm going to, I'm going to say yes. Um, it rings a bell. I can't place it like where I, where I remember that from, but it's, it sa sounds like it makes sense. And that might've been a, like a really big funeral that would have really drawn a lot of attention. Yeah. So here we go. This is what they did. Verse 32. They spread an evil report about the land straight up. This is what Mark was mentioning before. It says, Dibat Haaretz. Dibat is um, slander. Lashon Hara. This is how they, this is why this story is on the heels of Miriam's story. Because she was speaking ill of her brother and they spoke ill, an evil report about Israel, about the land which they had scouted. And what was the evil report? Telling the children of Israel. Again, telling the children of Israel. Imagine a general who was sent by the, by the, wait, um, I don't know. I don't know the, the ranks, but imagine the president or whoever sends a military representative to get intel and report back. And instead of going back to the president, they call a press conference and spill all the details. The people on so many levels, it's wrong. First of all, who are you to speak to, to you? That's not... You go back to the one who sent you, right? You report back to the one who sent you. You don't go and start number one. Number two, you know, and this is true today, the people that are in, involved, they are, I mean, hopefully qualified to deal with the, with the information, but not, the, not, not uh, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Joe Public, right? The people aren't, uh, don't know how to deal with news about military threats, but people in the military know how to deal with it. Are you with me on this? In other words, intelligence information. Anyway, th there's the information should have gone where it needed to go, not to the people. But this is what they did. They told the children of Israel, here we go. Here's the quote. The land we passed through to explore is a land, listen to this. It's a land that consumes its inhabitants. And I think that's a reference to the death that they saw right? As we just talked about. Um, yeah. A land that consumes its inhabitants. Everyone's dying. And all the people we saw in it are men of stature. In other words, they're all fearful Giant. people. There we saw the giants, the son of Anak, descended from the giants. Oh, the Nephilim, the Nephilim, the fallen ones. Nephilim, b'nei anak min ha -nephilim. The Nephilim were the angels that came down in the times of the flood to save the world, and they became the most corrupt. Angels said to God, hey, God, send us down. We'll fix humanity back in the times of Noah. And God sent down two angels, and they became the most corrupt. The bigger they are, the harder they fall. And the, 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 the scouts, the spies were telling the people, we saw the descendants of these fallen ones, of these fallen angels. And if angels can't take on this place, then how can we? They were so big in our eyes, we seemed like grasshoppers, and so we were in their eyes. And of course, the commentaries point out, this is what we call grasshopper syndrome, where when you think that you're small, 
then others begin seeing you that way. We seem like grasshoppers. We saw ourselves as tiny. And so we were in their eyes. And the Rebbe says, because a person looks at themselves as small, others begin to look at them as small as well. Whereas if you look at yourself as big, others will look at you as big. All right. So they had inferiority complex on top of all of the other stuff as well. Well, the natural result of this is panic. The entire community raised their voices and shouted, and the people wept on that night. All the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. And the entire congregation said, if only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this desert. Why does the Lord bring us to this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be as spoils. Is it not better for us to return to Egypt? They panicked. Let's go back, they said. We don't want to go further. We are all going to die. They said to each other, let us appoint the leader and return to Egypt. Well, yeah, that should take you into their headspace at that point. They literally were saying, let's get another leader. Forget about Moses. He still wants to go in. He's from the Brexit. No, he's whatever. He's from that old school. Let's get someone who's uh, not afraid to, to lead us back to Egypt. Now, at this point, like, what do you even do? If you're Moses, it's like, after all this, this blows up now? Like, what do you even mm. do, right? I mean, like, it's, you're done. So Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before the entire congregation, the children of Israel, of the children of Israel. They just, they were, they were finished. They literally fell on their faces. And, 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 and what did they say? What they do? I don't know. What is he, what is he doing? Doesn't, doesn't say anything. Doesn't say anything. He's they just fell on their faces before the entire congregation, the children of Israel. Verse six, Joshua, Yeshua. All right. Yeah. One, one thing. Yeah. Uh, Rashi has something pretty interesting. It says, literally, this is about paper. Uh, it says, uh, this Nitna Rosh. It says, literally, let us place ahead. Yeah. Said, this is to be understood as Targum Ankelos renders it. Let us appoint a leader. Let us not uh, let us set a king over us. Our working? rabbis explained as meaning an idol. That's what Rashi says. And then it's yeah. an Osio, uh, the Rabbi Rakiva. Akiva says, according to the rabbis, had the people intended to appoint a king, they would have said so clearly. Head, beginning, they meant to substitute from the God, the beginning of all existence. In other words, to replace God. Wow. Not only a new leader, but a new, a new mission statement altogether, a new God, a new deity. Yeah. Thank you for mentioning that. And, and, and the reference there is the Rosh, the head, meaning not just the leader head, but the ultimate head. God, replace God, God forbid. Okay, that's, that's, how, that's how panicked the people were. So what happens is Moses and Aaron fall on their faces. And the next scene, verse 6, is Joshua, Yeshua, the name change uh, fellow. Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the prayer at the graves, the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had scattered the land, they tore their clothes. They tore their clothes as a sign of mourning. We tear our clothes, or one tears their clothes when a loved one passes away. And they tore their clothes because what they were experiencing was nothing short of a colossal disaster and the beginning of, of just, just terrible sorrow for the people for generations, which we'll speak about in a moment. They spoke to the entire congregation, the children of Israel, saying, and it was Joshua and Caleb, the two spies that were not negative, that had not turned negative. So they spoke to the entire congregation, the children of Israel, saying, the land we, we passed through to scout is an exceedingly good land. They said, no, it's good, and we'll be okay. We'll end off over here. I just want to point out one thing. When did this happen? What day? It happened on Tisha B'Av, the ninth day of Av. This report that the spies came back with and the panic was on the day, the night, and the day of the ninth day of Av, which is the day on the Jewish calendar that is the saddest day. It's a day in which both holy temples were destroyed and many other calamities happened, including the, 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 um, the expulsion from Spain, the order that King Ferdinand and Queen, Is Queen Isabella signed was the Hebrew date, and that was the ninth of Av. Um, World War I began on, on, on the ninth of Av. Terrible calamities have befallen our people on the ninth day of Av, and it all begins from here, which is why they tore their clothes, because they saw that this was going to be the beginning of tremendous heartbreak and pain for the Jewish people. Hashem said, it says, essentially, according to the commentaries, you cried that night for no reason, right? The people cried. They wept. 
that night, the night of the ninth of Av. They wept. Oh no, we're all doomed. We're going to die. Hashem hates us. Moses hates. That's what they, they were crying. God says, you're crying for nothing. One day you'll have a reason to cry on this day. And unfortunately in our history, we have many, many reasons to cry on the ninth of Av, including for this story that started it all off. The story that we have in the second reading of the Torah portion of Shlach. Okay, so that's a bit of a negative note, I must say. Um, but what's the positive? I don't know. At least they got to make their own choice. <laughs> they messed up. They whiffed. They swung and missed. But it was them. It was at least them making the choice, which, as we said before, at least is something. Um, is there another element that I wanted to share? Um, Uh, ba, 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 ba. Um, yeah, I think like this. I think what we learn from Joshua and Caleb, I'll end with this. What we learn from Joshua and Caleb is the more connected we are with role models and leadership, the more successful we can navigate the intricacies and the challenges of life and make better choices. Right? 12 spies, two stayed kosher. 10 went off the deep end. Why those two? One of them had a very close relationship with Moses to the point that Moses gave him an additional letter to his name. And the other one prayed by the gravesite of his ancestors. Both plugged in, both were connected to something above, beyond, you might call it a rebbe, a leader, ancestors, right? some sort of higher tether. And when you're anchored above, it helps to not, it helps prevent falling below. Without, an, without a higher anchor, it's really easy to slip and fall when we encounter challenge. I'll end with a story. I think it might've been Rameer Primishlan, it might've been him. But some, one of the Hasidic masters was an older man and he lived, in, of course, you know, Russia or Eastern Europe, where it was very cold and icy for much of the year. And he went to mikvah every morning. We've talked about this before, right? Many men, or certainly it's a Hasidic concept, uh, uh, custom to go every morning to mikvah, men go every morning to mikvah. And so he would go, and the mikvah, of course, was like a natural body of water, a lake or whatever it was. It wasn't like an indoor heated, you know, deluxe building. It was, you know, an outdoor whatever body of water they had. And the only mikvah they had in this town was you had to go down a steep hill or mountain to get to. And even when it was winter and icy, this Rebbe would go every morning, early, early in the morning, and climb down the mountain and climb, go to the mikvah and climb back up. And he did so. And people would talk about the legend, the miracle of how the rabbi goes, even in the snow, even in the ice. Well, there were a few people that were, there were some young people who were very cynical. Like, oh, you got to be kidding me. Oh, a miracle worker. Really? You kidding me? He's just, you know, it's, maybe it's not that difficult to walk down the mountain in the ice. They said, you know what? We're going to try it. We'll show you. You guys think it's a miracle that your Rebbe is so like supernatural. He's not, he, he's able to do it without falling. You kidding me? We're going to do it. So they did it one day. They walked down and halfway through they slipped and fell. And the story, the way I've heard it is they, they, they had some serious damage, broke a few bones, etc. Like it wasn't just, you know, they got, they got, they got bruised ego and, and, and some, you know, like, you know, uh, black and blue marks. They got, they, they broke some bones. And after that, they realized that they had, you know, they had erred in their assessment and they went to the rabbi to ask for forgiveness. You know, even though they hadn't said anything to him, but they, you know, in their hearts and minds and in other conversations, they had spoken ill of him. You know, this guy is like a fake or whatever it is. So they went to, they went to him and said, Rabbi, we apologize and uh, very sorry. Accept the apology. Yeah, it's fine. And then they said, but let me ask you, but, but we have a question. How do you do it? Like, how did we try? There's no way. Like, how do you actually do it? What's, what's the secret? He said to them, and there's a Yiddish phrase, but I'm going to say it in English. When a person is bound, is tethered, connected above, 
one does not, does not fall below. So when we're connected to a higher place, then we don't fall below. Literally, figuratively, spiritually, and in other ways, having a higher tether can help us navigate the complexities of life safely, please God, without hazard. Are we never going to fall? Yeah, we're probably going to fall. But the stronger our connection with our roots, whether it's a Rebbe, a spiritual mentor, whether it's with our ancestors, right? But a, a, a higher connection, a connection that's bigger than us, that precedes us, greater than us, that's a fantastic uh, way to stay so strong and secure. And by the way, the anti-Semites know this. They know that the secret to sur Jewish survival is a connection with those that came before us. What's the first thing that anti-Semites do when they want to cause, cause problems? It's the first thing they do. You know what they do. They go to face a cemetery, God forbid. They go after the cemetery. And the question is, why a cemetery? Like, what, what kind of threat are the deceased to, to you? Why are you going after a cemetery? And, and one might argue and say, well, it's you know, the easiest target, no one to defend themselves. And that might be true. It's cowardly. Yes, it's true. But there's also a, a spiritual element as well, which may or may not be their intention, but I think it's powerful to mention. You know, the cemetery is where our history lies. Those that came before us, those that lived and breathed and died Jewish. And when we're connected with that, it makes us much stronger than who we are individually. Having a connection with generations of people who withstood any and all sorts of challenge for their faith. That's powerful. And that can keep us going on those cold, wintry days and nights, or even spring, summery days that are sometimes filled with treachery and challenge. What keeps us going is that connection. Joshua had his connection with his Rebbe, with Moshe, with, with, Moshe, with Moses, and Caleb had his connection with the Avais and Imahis, with the matri patriarchs and matriarchs. But that connection carried those two through. And so the message that I want to leave you with, a positive message is, let's plug in somewhere above us that will help us navigate the often treacherous paths of our lives. Thank you for joining me today for DPP. It is great to see you all. I hope you enjoyed. And um, Ari, could I add one more thing before you say goodbye? For sure, always. Uh, when I was in Israel in 1987, uh, I remember the guy pointing out, this is, our this is our holiest cemetery. It's where people emigrated here, uh, uh, were, were buried. And I said, I'd like to go there and see if I could find my great grandfather, my mother's, my mother's grandfather, because I know he immigrated there. And I see maybe some lineage. And they said, you're not going to be able to see anything because the Arabs took the tombstones, ground them up, and used them to make robes. And it's the same thing you're saying. Wow. Wow. That's, uh, that's terrible. That's a chutzpah. They took the headstones, yeah. the gravestones, and made it into paving, into roads? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That... Uh... I don't even know what to say, but saying that that's not cool is probably an understatement. I'm just going to say that's uh, the understatement of the year. All right, listen, we should positive on a positive note, we should strive to remain connected and recognize, you know what King David says in, in Psalms, from my enemies, I can learn something. From the, from the anti-Semite who seeks to destroy the past, we can learn a lesson of how important it is to connect with the past. So let's connect with the past and keep the fire burning and know that it's like a relay race. You have generation after generation running the race and passing the baton to the next, to the next. And now we're here. We are the ones that are above the ground roaming this earth, right? We are the Jews. We're the reps, the representatives. And we have that torch, the same torch that was held by Moshe. Moses and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Sarah and Rebecca and Rachel and Leah, the same torch. That's us now. That's an awesome responsibility. And it's amazing. And it shouldn't scare us. It should, it should empower us to not 
drop the baton. Keep on running and let's finish the race. And when we finish the race, everyone comes back onto the field to celebrate together. May it be so with Mashiach and Tchias Amesim. Let us say, Amen. Thank Amen. you for joining me today for DPP. Amen. Tonight we have the, um, the Hebrew class at 8 p.m., Memorial Day edition. We have tomorrow DPP at 12 and the JLI course. This can happen less than five at 8 p.m. tomorrow. And then regular classes this week. I think everything is pretty much on the usual. Torah studies Wednesday, JLI in person Thursday, daytime, uh, noontime. And then Thursday night, I don't think we have anything. What are you thinking for Wednesday DPP? Uh, oh, excellent question. Wednesday DPP. Um, let me think. Do I have anything? Oh, I may, I may have a Sandy Springs class right it's like i do it i've done it before like every so often um where i need to be up there to teach a lunch and learn at a business um right after our dpp oh you've seen me broadcast from there before sometimes when i have that class so there was a discussion about doing it last week but it the, last week wasn't possible so question is if it's going to come up for this week or not i don't know so i i would say it's pending I can definitely let you know tomorrow at this time. Is that, is that, okay. I'll let you know for sure tomorrow. I'll, I'll, I'll know by then. All right. Good. Great to see you all. Have a wonderful Thank day. You. We'll see you guys soon. Thank you. Yes, cool. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank Pleasure. you. Bye-bye. And Donna and Mark and Ray.